point is, is that understand that there's an inconsistency in what you're saying and what you actually believe. You don't actually believe that you only believe the things that you've seen before you've experienced before. What you're saying is, is I'm believing what's convenient for me because I want to sound smart. But my ego is so big, I can't let it slide down for just a second. And if you do, that's what I'm going to ask you the question. How could you possibly know things you've never experienced before? I mean, you know them. Last time I, I reviewed, I'm sorry, last time I reviewed the time before last, and I, I want to call your attention to this concept because it's an important thing, not just for, for Socrates' philosophy, but for kind of us in life generally. Oh. Remember, there's this ideal form of government, the aristocracy, which Socrates says has never existed before, but it exists in our minds. And he says that that's an important place for it to exist because it's the ideals that we have in our mind that give us something to strive and shoot for. The idea of being perfectly honest is the thing that if we aim for that, then of course we're not going to be perfectly honest, but we'll get closer to it. If instead we say, it's important to be honest 100% of, sorry, if we say it's important to be honest 100% of the time, we might get there 80% of the time. If we say it's important to be honest 50% of the time, we'll get there like 30 to 40% of the time. So the, the more perfect your aim, the more perfect your ideal, of course, the, the, the closer that you, you will get to attaining it probably. It's one of the reasons that we hate ideals so much, because ideals remind us how far, we, how far short we fall of them. And, and then that, of course, attacks our self-esteem. If instead we understand it properly as, is I'm aiming for 100%, I'm, you know, and I'm going to try to get there. And not excuse yourself like, but, you know, I'll never get there. We understand that intuitively, but don't give yourself a license not to attain your ideals. Every, they are in your life. Yeah. You shoot for the stars and you negotiate on the moon. There you go. Shoot for the stars and you negotiate on the moon. <laughs> Unless you get past the moon. Because here's the thing. Is it possible to go to the stars? Go on. Now, yeah. Now, with that attitude, you're going to put it up there with life is suffering and you don't know what you don't know. Life is too short. At my funeral, I expect to hear that. Yes, I plan to be there. So you aim for this, for this, for this, for this, for the, for the stars. Here's the thing. Someone's going to get there someday. May not be us. Maybe, you know, maybe a thousand years in the future, but somebody will get there. You aim for this ideal state. Now, falling short of it, boom, this one's pretty good. Honor's pretty good. But understand that honor is just an imitation of wisdom and reason. Honor is just an imitation of wisdom and reason. And that wealth is an imitation of honor. And that um, democracy, you know, collectivism, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, an imitation of wealth and so forth. So what's, what's causing us to fall short is that we have, well, I'm sorry, well, sorry what, what indicates that we're falling short is that we have an ideal, we don't quite reach it, it's an imitation of the ideal, it has to do with how far down that line we accept is, as we say in class, good enough. So remember, he's, a, he's uh, convicted of impiety. Mm -hmm. I talked last time about the death of Socrates, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. My, a couple classes I didn't get there. And this is where we left off, the forms. This is like the big takeaway. This is the big takeaway from, from Socrates' philosophy. All right. So we have a form called the ideal perfect path. <coughs> yes. Fat and white. Fat and white. <laughs> this is flat feet. Alchemy. My kitty looks nothing like this. Although he is, in fact, the ideal perfect kitty. The one that stayed, not the one that ran away. Oh. Now, so here's essentially what the forms are. Socrates is, again, he's trying to get to the bottom of this question, how do you know the things that you know? And in, in the West, we say, well, I know what I know because I've experienced it before. First off, that isn't true. There's lots of stuff you haven't experienced before, directly. You haven't experienced the Eiffel Tower. You haven't experienced the Sphinx. You haven't experienced that cave in Vietnam that I talked about. There's a lot of things that you haven't experienced. Well, but I've heard about it. Uh, so you trust other people's... Um, you, know, uh, you trust other people's reports. Well, yeah, I guess so. By the way, there's nothing wrong with that. You guys ever gone to an airplane before? Yes. Mm -hmm. You guys ever go up and you check the credentials of the pilot, make sure he knows how to fly? No. No, no he just wears that cool jacket and hat and you sit there and go, he looks like he knows what he's doing. Hey, 
guys ever come in here and you, you know, dissect what it, what it is I actually believe and think? No, we just kind of say, well, he's a teacher, he must know something, or he must know nothing, whatever your, whatever your bias is. So Socrates believes that you, we, we don't really know most of the things that we know. Now, in the West, we say we know what we know because we learn through the five senses. We see, hear, touch, taste, feel, smell. However, he points out that there are things that you know that you've never experienced before. And you know them because you can describe them, you can define them. And one of those things is eternity. Eternity. You've never experienced eternity before. In fact, you physically cannot. It's part of having a, a physical body that you never can experience eternity. Because the physical body you know, has a beginning point, which means that you couldn't have existed before that. And your body is going to have an end point, which means you won't be able to uh, you won't be able to experience the universe after that. And so you, and in fact, you don't even have experience of what your life is going to be like in, in two minutes. You only have experience of what your life has been like in the last film, like how many years you've been alive. And even a big chunk of that is not even open to your to your personal consciousness. It's it's buried down there in your personal unconscious. So how can you possibly know what eternity is? Well, someone told me, yeah, 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 yeah. All the way down the line, how does anybody have a concept of that? Because the only way that we have a concept, yeah, so here's the thing. Uh, think of a word for a thing that you've never experienced before. <laughs> but you have experienced it with that one hug. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to rat you out with that other thing, man. Come on. I just sit. Okay. Maybe that won't make it into the video. <laughs> Maybe there'll be a quick cut there, jump cut. Um, but there are lots of things that you've never experienced before, but you seem to know what they are. Now, you can, you can experience things directly or tangentially, but none of us have ever experienced eternity. None of us have ever experienced perfection before. And yet, somehow, we have a word for it, which means that there has to be some awareness of it, because we only have words for things that exist. We only have words for things that exist. There's no word for a thing that doesn't exist, because you wouldn't have a name for it unless you've encountered it before. One day you came across this and someone's like, oh no, what's that called? What does it do? It marks. Alright, we'll call it a marker. If this thing didn't exist, we wouldn't have the word marker, if this makes sense. So the question is, how can we possibly have words for things like perfection, eternity, unconditional love, all kinds of things, I guess. So, here's Socrates, so, sorry. so Socrates is trying to answer that question. So that's important for us to understand. He's trying to answer that question about how it is that we know what we know. And this is the solution that he comes up with. He says, before you were born, this is you. Actually, no, that's not you, is it? <laughs> because you're not your body. He argues that before you were born, what we refer to as your psyche, the actual you that's you, you ran around out here in the universe, out here in the cosmos. And while you were out there, you encountered everything there is to know. You encountered the idea, the idea of, a, of a perfect chair, let's say. So you encountered a chair as a chair. You encountered the idea, the actual essence of the idea of eternity. Why? Because you are existing in eternity. Because you are an eternal soul. That's how you've experienced it before. You didn't experience it with your physical body. That's an impossibility. But instead, you experienced it with your eternal psyche because that's your actual nature. Your essence, your nature is eternal. It's not temporal, it's eternal. You've experienced things like love, so that's how you know what it is when you encounter it. You've experienced things like perfection because you've experienced a, a perfect soul, a soul that's not been corrupted yet. Yeah. 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 So, is it possible for like the ancestral thing, like ideas going passed down, and this still like exist at the same time, or is it like God damn right. everything like, that we've learned then just passed down to our mind, and we just know not to do that? Like both. Put our hand next to us. Yeah, both. Because you've because you've encountered everything throughout here, and you also have a a a, a, a connection to the collective unconscious. I. I can explain it, I'll do it afterwards, it's really, really technical. But it's, but I'll, I'll, right now I'll say yes, and I'll explain it more deeply later. But yes, essentially, everything that you encounter out here goes into your personal unconscious, 
and it also goes into the collective unconscious. So whatever you've experienced, I've experienced. Whatever I've experienced, you've experienced. Oh my. Yeah. Wait, so does that bring like the concept of reincar reincarnate or incarnation where um, they say like, if you die, like your physical body dies, you come back as a new form, but you retain the knowledge you had from your past life, so you still have the knowledge from the past life. Uh, from from the next and within your new life and then you gain more knowledge after that. Well, the idea is that you always have this knowledge that you were born with. Yeah. So reincarnation doesn't add knowledge to you. Yeah. It just changes your, your, your possible form of existence. Yeah. And by the way, these are called the forms. That's what these are. The, you've encountered the form of eternity. You've encountered the form of perfection, the form of love, the form of a chair. And by the way, you've encountered something else that's very, very important. Depression? No. Oh. People. People. Oh. You ever meet somebody and you feel like you've known your whole life? Yes. Yeah, I wonder if they were running around out here in eternity with you and you interacted with them. And then they were born into a different body. And then you come across them and you're like, hey, I recognize that soul. Because you recognize it at an unconscious level. Yeah. I think, I think why a lot of people are so uh, apprehensive to believe stuff like this is because. Uh, there's a saying that my mom told me where it was at. It was in Spanish, but it roughly translates to you can't learn something from somebody else's head. You can't learn from what? You can't learn something from somebody else's head. I said head, not mind, because right. it's all like, I can't learn what it's like to run into a wall and you can tell me. But that's a very physical thing. Stuff like this is very of the mind. Yeah. Mind and and that's the hard part, you're right. It's about breaking that thing down. But, and this is why I point out, people will say things like, man, I don't believe in this. I don't believe, believe in things I can see, I've experienced. You fool, you believe in the Eiffel Tower? I've seen it before. You've seen pictures of something. You've never seen the Eiffel Tower before. You've never seen the Sphinx before. You've never seen the American Revolution. You've never seen the Civil War. There's all kinds of things that you've never, many of you have never seen the Atlantic Ocean before. But you believe in it? The point is, is that understand that there's an inconsistency in what you're saying and what you actually believe. You don't actually believe that you only believe the things that you've seen before, you've experienced before. What you're saying is, is I'm believing what's convenient for me because I want to sound smart, but my ego is so big, I can't let it slide down for just a second. And if you do, that's what I'm going to ask you the question. How could you possibly know things you've never experienced before? I mean, you know them. Remember, Socrates has a very high standard for knowledge. It's not just a true belief. Like, you have a true belief that the Eiffel Tower is there, but you don't have knowledge that the Eiffel Tower is there. How can you possibly have knowledge, not true belief, but knowledge of what these things are? The only possible way is that you've encountered them before. And you cannot encounter perfection with your body. You cannot encounter perfection with eternity. You cannot encounter things that are... That are, that are mental with the physical, but you have knowledge of the mental. And that's the question he's trying to answer here. How could you possibly do that? And again, you've encountered people out here. That might be why it is that when you encounter them in this life, you feel like you've known them for all of eternity, because you kind of have. You encountered them out there. You know them. Yeah. But here's the problem. You're running around out there, and one day, your parents hook up. Think about that, and then talk with your therapist. Oh, and nine months later, you, your soul is sucked out of, the, out of this eternity that you're running around in, and you are born. Yeah. Now, you ever see a, a newborn baby, and they're like, looking around, where the hell am I? They look confused. Why? Because they were just pulled out of the spiritual realm, and they were sucked down into the physical realm. And they're trying to make sense of what it is that they're encountering. That looks kind of like this, but that physical chair is an imitation of the perfect chair that I've encountered out there in the universe. I'm trying to attain this perfect love, but never seems to fulfill this ideal that I have of what love is supposed to be because the love on this world is an imitation of that. We'll say things like, oh, this is a perfect cheeseburger. It's not perfect. We use that word, 
because we have access to the word, but we're trying to draw an analogy between the thing that we're eating and the form of perfection that we've encountered out there in the universe. Same with eternity. Oh my God, scanlon has been talking forever about this. No, I haven't. It's only been four days. But it sure seems like eternity, doesn't it? So when you're born, you for, the, 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 the act of being born is so traumatic that you forget everything. All of that knowledge that you had has now been pushed back into your personal unconscious. And you can start to recognize things. You can kind of recognize that soul that you've interacted with. You can recognize that that's supposed to be a chair. Well, I guess it is a chair for the physical world, but it's only an imitation of the perfect chair. The love that you have here is an imitation of, 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 of perfect love. In fact, the perfection that you experience here, which just means really good, is just an imitation of perfection. And what's, what only goes on for four days just feels like an eternity. It's an imitation of eternity. That's why everything in this, in this world feels so unsatisfactory. Because it's not quite the thing that we've encountered out here in, this, in the spiritual world. Or the act. This, is, this is referred to as the spiritual world or, more properly, I guess, the intellectual world. So now this is what happens. You're born. You forget everything. And then someone's talking to you, and you're like, this makes no sense. But then again, you've forgotten how to, how to think, you've forgotten how to, how to talk, you've forgotten what language is. So now somebody has to come along, and I don't tell you what language is. I don't sit there with a baby and say, every sentence must have a verb. Instead, I talk to you. And by talking to you, I help you remember that every sentence has to have a verb. I help you. I don't come in here and just tell you, here's what Socrates says. I help you remember what Socrates says, because you've already encountered it before. I can't teach you anything. The whole act of teaching, therefore, is making the unconscious conscious. Taking things out of that realm that you have, of things that you have forgotten and bringing it up into your field of awareness. And then you say, ah, I now have learned much. No, you haven't learned anything. You've been reminded of a lot. And so, again, Socrates believes that you know everything. Not like a 12-year-old who says, I know everything. But you actually genuinely do know everything. Yeah. Um, I think it's very funny that, you know, well, what's, the, what's the first, like, written language that you know about in history? Um, some argue it's Hebrew. I've also heard Sumerian. Yeah. Because uh, Hebrew, uh, I mean, yeah, Hebrew is a Torah language. It's something like Mesopotamia. Sumerian was like first like real civilization civilization. We have found language we go back before that. Oh yeah. We have found like not language, but like pictures that represent things that create language. Way, way before the Mesopotamia. And that's strange that we have languages even before we knew what languages were. We have we didn't even have a word for them. Yeah. Yeah, how do you convey that concept to someone that a, that a, a sound represents a, a physical thing in the in the world? All right, if I say marker, I'm going to show you this. This is a technical thing. So if, you, if you get it, you get it. If not, don't worry about it. But if you understand that a sound represents an object in the world, this is the object that actually exists in the world. The sound that I make, marker, is an imitation of this thing. It's a, it's a sound representation of this thing. It's not the thing itself. And you start thinking about stuff like that, it really can, can jack you up. Like the whole thing about what, what came first, the chicken or the egg, which sends you in this, this spiral. What came first, language or thought? Because if you don't have language, you can't represent thought. If you don't have thoughts, then, there's nothing, then you can't keep develop language. And so, you're right. There's something about pictorial. That's why I said um, Hebrew. Because there seems to be, to be an ancient form of Hebrew that was, that was pictographic, like hieroglyphics. They seem to be pictures of things. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Do you mean that? It's just more of a clarification. Like, for the perfection, or you know how you put the example of the chair? Do you mean that we literally have a picture of a perfect chair, or is the idea of perfection that we try to connect to things that don't look perfect? I don't know if that makes sense. Good question. So, um, two answers. First off, that you've encountered this idea of what a chair is supposed to be. And that means it's sturdy, it's strong, you know? And so, every chair that we make, is an imitation of the perfect chair that we've encountered out there. And then we use the word perfection, though, as an analogy. In other words, we've never experienced it before, but we use it just to, to try to convey a thought to people. And so if I say, like, oh my gosh, this is perfect, 
What I mean is, is that it's really good. It's not actually flawless, because there's nothing that is flawless. And in order for me to say, like, for example, like, oh, this, you know, uh, I don't know, like a marker file, the sky, I caught it. Oh my god, that was so perfect. I don't know if it's perfect. Because what if that me catching that marker, me saying, oh my gosh, this is so perfect, now delays my life by three seconds, and then I get hit by a car later. I wouldn't have been hit by that car if I hadn't caught the marker. So we can't know that it's actually perfect. So it's a word that we use to describe a thing, but the idea is that we have access to the idea of perfection, and then we use that to apply it to things, just to mean really, really good. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yes, John. Does that mean, like, when you mentioned, oh no, when you showed the demonstration of Psyche, where we're just all over the place until we were born, does that mean, like, when we, like, I thought the idea was, like, so every single time we dream, like every time we go to sleep, we have like this astral projection, like basically in our minds where we're like we're in a different world, and for some reason sometimes you get to experience something you've never experienced, but sometimes you either do two things after you do it. You wake up, you forget the entire thing completely, and number two, you remembered it. So like my mindset's like, wait, does that mean that was like my uns does that mean that's my like unconscious, my collective unconscious, and then I just remembered it right there, and I, and then just popped up, or it just appeared, like it, it pulled pushed through my pushed into my conscience, and then gets pushed back in there, and then you just forgot to complain. I'm like, what what happened? Wait, what? I need to know now. So interestingly, um, you believe that when you dream, you have, you have dreams about going two places. You believe that you actually were going two places. Like you, that, you're, that you're essentially your your psyche, your spirit, your soul, whatever you want to call it, leaves your body and travels someplace. He writes this story about having freaked completely out because he had this dream about going to a temple and seeing a monk um, meditating, and it occurred to him that the monk who was meditating had manifested him rather than the other way around. Yeah, it's, it's a long story, but it ends up leading him into a, into a near psychosis. It freaked him completely out, but. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever done this before, but you ever have a dream about somebody, and then you're talking to them, it turns out they have the exact same dream? No. God, I think You're yeah. talking to them, and... I, so I, I had a friend, um, shortly after high school, I was, when I was in college, she was really big on this stuff, and she we would be intentional, and we, she called it intentional dreaming, where we would go to sleep, thinking about meeting up and talking. And then we would, have, we would go to sleep, and then as soon as we woke up, we had, had a pad there, and we wrote down the dreams that we would have. And her, uh, she wanted to see if we could actually meet up in this dream world and have a conversation and talk. Because she really believed that we, we could do this. Um, you know, I'll try anything two or three times. So I'm sure, why not? We'll, we'll, we'll do it. And so we, um, we, we, would, we would keep a, a dream log, but we wouldn't share it every night. We'd only share it every two weeks. And then afterwards, we would compare what we had dreamt about. And over the course of a, of, of a few months, sharing these things every two weeks, we had several conversations in common. We met someplace, we described the same place that we were, we described the same conversations. There were some differences in like the details of it, but I mean that's true about any conversation that you have with somebody. And so Jung would say, yeah, because that's an actual doorway into a different world. William Blake, the poet, believed this as well. Socrates would say, yeah, you know, your spirits, you know, you know, and you're, you, have a, you have a body and a soul. And these things don't always have to stay together, because once the body dies, the soul is free. When the body sleeps, who's to say, therefore, then that the soul is not free to wander? And then all of a sudden, you ever all of a sudden wake up out of a dream and you're completely bewildered and you have no idea where you are? Maybe your soul's having to run back to your body. You know? It's like, oh, shoot, I'm getting called back. And you're running over there and your body wakes up and you're like, where is it? And then all of a sudden, your soul comes back and you're like, oh, I'm at home. Now I know where I am. My favorite place, Hamlet. He says, there are greater things in heaven and earth than we dream of in our philosophies. In other words, there's way more to the world and the universe than we can possibly account for in our philosophy. Philosophy is nice. Philosophy helps us make sense of the world. By the way, so does religion and so does culture. I put philosophy in the same category as religion and culture. Um, how do you know what's right or wrong? You go to the Bible, the Bible tells you what's right or wrong. You go to the Quran, you go to the Upanishads, they tell you what's right or wrong. How do I know what's right or wrong? Well, my culture, well, you know, how I was raised tells me what's right or wrong. How do I know what's right or wrong? Well, my philosophy helps me discern what's right or wrong. All three of those things help us to interpret the world. The problem is when we get too rigidly, um, uh, too rigidly um, dependent on those things. 
so that your religion, your culture, and your philosophy stop you from experiencing new things, and they stop you from interpreting how things might actually be. In other words, then they get too dogmatic, and you're no longer able to actually live a life. Um, now, that doesn't mean that therefore you should toss those things aside just so that you can live a life, because you, those things are in place for a reason. Your morals, your standards, your, your thoughts, your, your behaviors, they're all in place for a reason. Only make sure that they're your reasons, and that they're not imposed upon you by, by, by people or groups that have no right imposing themselves on you. Socrates is very free in all of this stuff. And by the way, that's why he's not afraid to die. Because he knows that when, before, he, before this happened, he was here. And he knows that once he dies, he goes here. And I told you about Asclepius, yes? His last words, we owe, we owe a rooster to Asclepius. And Asclepius is the god of medicine. Mm -hmm. He's essentially saying, make a sacrifice to the god of medicine. Because, that, because the body, I'm sorry, death, death is the cure for the body. Death is the cure for physical existence. But once I die, I then get to go back to the, to the spiritual world and re-encounter and, and, and be what I truly, truly am. If any of you guys ever walk around and you just stop and you're looking at the world and you're just like, God, I don't belong here. Yeah. You, you're right. You don't. You belong there. That's your nature. That's where you are. That's where you're supposed to be. And then once you get free of this body, you go there. Now, having said that, don't be in a big rush to, to get back over there. You're going to get back there. And when you get there, you're going to spend eternity there again. Or, maybe through reincarnation you get born again. Oh, who knows? But the idea is that you're going to go back to there. Don't be in such a rush for it. There's so much to do on this planet. And you can't experience everything up here that you can down here. Which would be the purpose of, of coming down here. To experience as much as possible. To do all of the things that you want to do. Not to be afraid of them. What's the worst that happens? You try something and you fail. What's the worst that can happen to you in life? Die. You die. Yeah. Guess what? You're going to. It's the ultimate statistic. I'm not making this up. You can look this up. Ten out of ten people die. It's true. If you look up in any medical journal, they'll tell you the same thing. You're going to die. And yet, you wake up every day fully 100% aware that the worst thing that could possibly happen to you is going to happen to you. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. But someday it's going to happen. And you know it's going to. And so much of your life is geared towards trying to ignore that fact that you're going to. Socrates isn't ignoring that fact at all. He's saying, hey, if this happens, this happens. And if it does, that's wonderful. I get to go back and experience life as I, as I was intended to, in the soul form. And if it doesn't happen today, I get to do some of the things I really, really want to do. What do you want to do? I don't know. If, if the world was going to end tomorrow, what would you do right now? Fuck around? Do whatever Find out? Uh, <laughs> do whatever? Well, I would finish this talk. <laughs> because that's, that's all that matters. The, the right now is all that matters. What's in the past is in the past. It's a memory. It's probably a false memory anyway. Whatever's in the future hasn't happened yet. So it's only a hope. It's a desire. It's not a real thing. The only real thing is the moment right now. And my, I guess my, my question is this. If, you, if the world were to end tomorrow and you would do something completely different, then maybe that's what you should be doing right now. The thing that actually drives your passions, the thing that actually excites you, the risks that you want to take but you're afraid. But well, what if I fail? What if this happens? What if, 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 what if it works out? What if we shoot for the, the stars and we only end up on the moon? You know? What if we shoot up for the moon and our, and our space shell blows up? It's a hell of a story, though, isn't it? Oh, wow. Think about some of the most tragic failures of your life. There's probably a pretty good story attached to it. And if you don't oh. think so, come and talk to me and tell me what it is. I'll make a joke of it. Honestly. Please do. Not to make a joke of you, but to make a joke of the tragedy. Because it's not. you failed. So what? You're going you're gonna to die. <laughs> you can deal with that fact, but we can't deal with the fact of living with it with the embarrassment of failure. I can't possibly live with failing like every other human being in the history of the world has failed. Even the most accomplished have, have failed more times than they've succeeded. And yet somehow, some way, I can wake up every day and manage to live with that awareness, but I cower in fear from, from failure.
Try it, man. Like a great, like a great song once said, shyness is nice. But shyness can stop you from doing the things in life you want to do. And coyness is nice. And coyness can stop you from doing the things you like to do. <coughs> so if there's something you like to try, try. And if you don't know the song, you should. And if you do know the song, you're one of my favorite people in the world. <coughs> yeah. yeah. It's crazy how people make it. Make it. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, it could be anything, bro. You can be anything at this point. So let me stress here, especially for the yeah. sake of the video. Don't go die. Don't go don't, die. Don't be in a big rush to get back here. You're going to get there eventually. Don't be in a rush. Don't be in a, in a, in a rush for the inevitable. But things are going to happen anyway. Yeah. You can be in such a rush for the inevitable that we miss all the fun stuff, or all the interesting stuff, or all of the experiential stuff that could happen between here and there. And that's really what most of life is. When you look at people's, and you look at the highlights of your life, how often do those highlights happen? And let's say they happen, let's say they even happen once every two days. Fine, that, that, that'd be an incredibly exciting life. There's still a lot of time in between those two days, and that's going to make up the bulk of your life. So if you find something interesting and useful in the mundane, this is how you make a useful and, and exciting life. If you mention Kung Fu Panda, I'm going to kick you right between your eyes. You don't like It gives you a mind, like, your mind just Holy shit. goes blank. He actually has a point. Yeah. He actually has an interesting point, for those of you who missed it. He's asking the question, how is it you can possibly dream about something before it happens? Yeah. Here's the, because here's the trip. Eternity. When does eternity happen? Right now. Right now. Right here? Right now. Everything all at once, the movie says. This is eternity. Which means you have access to future events as well. You have access to past events. Perfectly. As they actually happen. Because if you consider it, we think of it, we think of um, as everything in the West as being teleological, beginning, middle, end. No, 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 it's everything all at once. Which means that if you are able to step outside of time, you can see all of time from beginning, middle, to end. If you're living in eternity, you can do that. The physical world is bound by time, beginning, middle, and end. Your soul lives outside of that. It lives in eternity, which means you can watch all of your life like you watch a movie. You can fast forward over certain parts, rewind, and watch it again. You can experience it. Um, if there's a favorite movie that you guys have that you've memorized, you can experience the whole movie all at once in your mind. Even Kung Fu Panda. Yeah. And that's one of those things that you can know without experience. That's the trip. So that's your yeah, I know, right? So think about, think about this. Here's, here's, here's a trip that you've never experienced nothing this before, and yet you know what it is. That's another one that, that blows our minds. You might think, well, nothingness just means that there's nothing there. Where have you ever experienced anything that has nothingness? You never have. Even when you close your eyes, there's color. There's always something. There's never nothing. And yet we seem to know what nothingness is. That's why death terrifies some people so much because they think that death is nothing. They think that death is nothingness. It's not. It's a return to this place. We might get pulled back, but for now, questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques.